Thank you very much. Um, I, I should start out, the reference to hockey here is only partially a uh, uh, obvious attempt to uh, pander to the local uh, New England scene. I, I will uh, mention its relevance in just a little bit. So uh, there are many people that feel that the current paradigm in cyber defense is uh, failing us. We're seeing a huge spike in both the number and severity of cyber attacks. Um, both in the government and private industry, the loss of IP, the loss of secrets. Uh, and so what I'd like to talk to you about today is a little bit of description of that paradigm, um, why it's failing, and here's a little hint that has to do with scale and complexity. Some of the new paradigm ideas that are emerging, uh, and if I can keep this under the time, I'll give you some ideas if you are not a cybersecurity person of how you might help and contribute to where this is going. So you can summarize the philosophy of the cyber defense community over the last 20 to 25 years with the notion of reducing the attack surface. We have a set of systems. We want to prevent any adversary from getting to those systems and doing any kind of damage. So what do we focus on? Perhaps some of you have had to patch a system recently. Perhaps you have antivirus software on your computer. Um, perhaps depending on what industry you're in, you actually have to insert a physical ID card into the computer in order to use it. We monitor our networks, we build firewalls, we watch the traffic that goes across those. When we deploy large scale systems, either in the government or commercial systems, we do this very heavy certification and accreditation process to ensure that they don't have any vulnerabilities. We try like heck to train users um, to do the right behavior. And yet, it doesn't quite seem to be working. There's a lot of reasons for that, to be fair. It's a complex problem. The two that I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the adversary has gotten a lot more advanced. Um, and I'm going to talk about how the scale of this problem has simply gr grown beyond our ability to manage it. So let's walk through a few facts. So at the end of this year, depending on which estimate you like, there'll be about 10 billion devices on the internet. That means everybody on the planet gets one. Um, and then there's a whole lot left over. And all we need to do to protect those is know where every one of them are, make sure they are updated with the latest software patches, and make sure we are controlling access in every way to those devices. Should be fairly straightforward. If we can't do that, perhaps we can watch all the traffic that is traveling across those devices and look for anomalies, denial of service attacks, all those things you hear about. So Cisco Systems, that knows a little bit about this, um, estimates that in a few years, the mobile devices alone, just our phones and tablets, um, will be exchanging about 10 exabytes of data. There's some small print on the bottom that tells you that 10 exabytes is about 160 million iPhones worth of data, um, which is about, I think, what Apple sold in its first week of the iPhone 5. Oh, by the way, th the, that 10 exabytes, that's per month. So we. I don't really think we have much chance of monitoring all that traffic that's going across our networks. Now, one of the big weaknesses uh, uh, John mentioned with uh, computer security is the people, right? All of us. I admit it. Uncle Phil sends me the picture of the dancing cats, and I just got to click. And then that little box comes up, and something funny is going on in my machine, and I say, sure, go ahead, just show me the dancing cats. And that's the end of that. So the good news is not everybody on the planet is on the internet yet. The bad news is it's growing pretty rapidly, about 15% a year. By the way, the security professionals and the hackers have a special name for these 300 million new users a year. Uh, we call them targets. OK, so there are too many computers. There's too much traffic to follow. We can't stop the users from doing all their stuff. Maybe our software can help us. Maybe we can write better software. Let's start with a really simple example. The soap dispenser. Automatic soap dispenser, you put your hand under it, the soap comes out. Um, this is actually from the kitchen of my friend Dave, true story. Um, Dave was unhappy with the amount of soap that was coming out of his soap dispenser when he put his hand under it. So the two of us spent a weekend taking it apart, completely voiding the warranty, um, downloading the instruction set from the chip and said, how hard could this be? All we have to do is adjust the amount of soap. It turns out that to run a photo gate, an LED, a motor, and a push button, there's over 1,200 instructions, 16 state variables, and a whole bunch of spaghetti code. So what chance do we have of securing our soap dispensers? OK, you say, that's just a toy problem. That's just a soap dispenser. 
Let's talk about a real system. The Boeing 787 Dreamliner is rolling off the assembly line right now. The avionics system alone has over six and a half million lines of code. There isn't any way that we are going to be sure that that software, first of all, is completely right, but I don't want to scare you from flying. Um, second of all, that it is uh, secure from uh, vulnerabilities. Oh, vulnerabilities, let's talk about that. So the National Vulnerability Database issued about 4,000 software vulnerabilities last year. That is the floor, that is a gross underestimate of the total number of vulnerabilities. Most people process these things as fast as they can. They focus largely on major systems. So every day, our cyber adversaries get 11 new chances to figure out how to penetrate our systems. So this whole concept of reducing the attack surface simply may be the wrong approach. It's wrong from the, from the point of view of scale, but it has another problem. So let's get to the hockey example, the hockey metaphor. When, when we are trying to reduce the attack surface, we are essentially playing hockey as the goalie and facing the goal. We are focused on the target. We are focusing our efforts on the size and the shape of the target. Where are we in the right position? Do we know the shape? And what's going on right now is the goal is getting bigger. The target is getting bigger. We have users coming in and adjusting the target. We now have mobile devices, new, new goals floating all around. It's the wrong way to play the game. And in hockey, you, you can see, just look at this, what's the right way to play the game? Turn around. Turn around, why do we turn around? You have to face the adversary. You have to understand the adversary. You have to watch what they do. You have to understand what direction they come from and how they pass the puck. You have to share that information with your team. If it's a really bad adversary, you may even share it with other teams. You have to not sit there and let the puck come to you, right? You have to probe that attack to see if you can understand it. So in hockey, it makes perfect sense. What does that look like in the cyber realm? In the cyber realm, we talk about three things, just like the hockey example. We talk about collecting cyber threat intelligence. We have to find a way to understand better what the adversary is doing. We have to find a way to engage that adversary during the time of the attack and we have to do a better job of sharing this information so that when I get sick, you get the vaccine. Let's talk about each of these quickly. This is something called the cyber kill chain. Uh, it's been around for a few years and it's gaining a lot of ground. It essentially captures the seven stages of a cyber attack. We've just changed the whole view just in the last 10 seconds. I've changed your view of a cyber attack from a point in time. Most of us think of that little click when we got the, the kitten picture from Uncle Phil, that was the attack. That wasn't the attack. That's just the middle. That's just the exploit. There are seven stages. The adversary has to understand what our systems are, who we are, and who we want to go after. He has to build a weapon. He has to deliver the weapon. We have to click on it. He has to control something on our systems. He has to execute that code, and the advanced cyber adversary, the one we are most afraid of, will stay on that system for as long as they possibly can to either use us or get more information later. By, by understanding the cyber adversary in this way, we can gain new intelligence. We can monitor what they do. We can do it forensically after we are attacked. And make no mistake, advanced professionals today assume we will be penetrated. We do not assume we can protect the attack surface and keep people out. One of the ideas that's gaining a lot of traction and we've got some early successes in is something called synthetic environments. Can we fool the adversary into thinking they are on our network and watch them while they do that. Don't stop them, don't block them, don't kick them out, watch them and control them, divert them. You can learn a lot of interesting things with this. So for example, it turns out that for most of these folks, uh, uh, the adversaries, it's a job. They have a job to do. You know how I know that? Because if you collect a lot of evidence over time, if you analyze all this stuff, you can tell what hours of the day they work. <laughs> it turns out many of them work an eight hour day just like us. Isn't that interesting? See, it's all just one world. <laughs> it's a job. They have to build weapons and control systems and executions and hide software on your system all day long. What would you do if you had to do that? You would reuse code, wouldn't you? I'm not going to write a new one every time. I'm going to reuse it. Now I've got a new, now I have a better understanding of their methodology. When I go out to command and control servers, I'm an adversary, I have to link to the outside, I don't want to stand up new servers. I already have 100 servers. I'll just reuse some of the IP addresses I already have. 
I may even reuse the encryption keys that John just talked about if I'm an adversary where I'm encrypting my traffic. I may hard code the passwords to those keys in my code. You know what? Turns out the adversaries choose crummy passwords too. Uh, what else do we learn? We see uh, uh, adversaries that, that come back, so we need to be able to adapt. So one of our partner organizations has an adversary that comes after their network on a regular basis, a long period of time, more than days in, into weeks. So regularly do they come back that when our partner doesn't see the attack, they check their calendar and they don't see an attack, they completely change their defensive posture. They assume they have missed it. They assume that adversary has gotten past them and gotten in so we can adapt as we go. So once I collect that intelligence, I need some way to share it. Right? I'm not going to get every adversary coming after me, and even the ones that do come after me, quite frankly, I'm going to miss some of them. And again, I want to share this notion, I get sick, you get the vaccine. So there is a lot of sharing that goes on today. It suffers from three problems. One, the communities that form in that sharing um, are very ad hoc. They're based on personal trust relationships. So you don't get widespread uniform sharing. Um, the sharing happens at a very informal level, unstructured, often in email. I try and write up an attack. Because of those first two things, it's very high level information. It's not very actionable. Somebody has to read an email, figure out what that means, translate it into some kind of defense. So to improve this sharing, we want to focus on two things. We want to focus on a better way to share this thread information, a more structured, detailed way and we want to improve this community sharing structure. So right now there's a lot of work in uh, what we call standards-based repositories. Very simple idea. Can we standardize the description of these attacks? Can we standardize descriptions and build schemas, database schemas, XML schemas, around malware, around vulnerabilities, around threats, around the actual attacks themselves, around whole campaigns of attacks? If we can do that and enable it, we do a whole bunch of things. One, we start to collect more detail about the attacks because we have a way to capture it and represent it. Two, we get uniformity. I know what to share and I know what to expect. Three, I have a much better way to control the sharing. If I don't want to share every detail of the attack with everybody I know, and I may not want to because it might reveal something about my system, if I have a structured representation, I have a much better way to control that. Four, I start to enable machine-to-machine -machine sharing. That's the holy grail here. Right? It takes too long to read emails, figure out what action I want to take, change my defensive systems. Right? If I can do machine-to-machine -machine sharing in structured ways, I can implement those changes much, much faster. And five, as I build up these uh, uh, repositories, I get to do analysis over time. We have a database with over th uh, uh, three million malware samples. I can start to really understand what's in common there. That's where I start to see times of day, months, places to hide code. Once I build those repositories, I now have a more, uh, I, I can now facilitate the sharing across these communities. So this, this is a very fluid problem. There's no solution. And it's a hard problem because it's a social problem of how to organize that sharing. You, we see a lot of different models out there. Very common is a hub and spoke model. A number of uh, participants will get together. They pick one trusted partner. They send all their information to that one trusted partner who merges it, cleans it up, and sends it out. That has pros and cons. Um, uh, it, it gives you the value add of the hub. It uh, enables a trust model where you trust the hub. It tends to be slow to turn over. You tend to get filtering. Uh, there's post to all. We can all get together as a group. And every time I see something, I send it to all of you. You can all see it. You can comment on it. That has uh, pros and cons as well. Uh, we're seeing more and more um, uh, energy around federated communities like this where within the smaller communities, we have a tight trust, a circle of trust between us, um, and we can share everything. And if we have these repositories, that's very easy to do. And then as we want to share more broadly into or with organizations or people we may not know as well, we can do that controlled sharing that I talked about. Still a very fluid situation. Lots of uh, opportunities there for improvement. Um, speaking of opportunities, so uh, we've had some successes in all of these things I've talked about. The uh, synthetic environments, uh, the structured repositories you uh, might have seen up there. There's a system uh, that MITRE and a number of other members of the community are working on called CRITS. Uh, it's just an example database that uses a whole set of standards. The standards are community-owned. Um, and the sharing models, uh, there's a 
public-private partnership in Massachusetts called the ACSC, uh, the Advanced Cybersecurity Center, uh, which is really focusing on this information and threat sharing. Uh, the defense and the government uh, do a lot of the threat sharing. But here's some areas uh, that could use improvement. So this defensive engagement um, is an area ripe for research. Uh, if you think about these synthetic environments trying to fool an adversary uh, into believing they are on a real computer network, you have to get a topo uh, network topology that looks right. You have to have files, file structures, systems, and programs that look legitimate. Um, you have to have traffic and activity on that network that looks legitimate. Um, when we do these engagements, we see adversaries that land in that spot, and the first thing they do is just a whole set of techniques to try and figure out whether they're in a real place or a fake place. There's a lot of opportunity there. One challenge is the people that do this well um, don't publish it. Uh, it's not really something they want to get out. Uh, but there are some intermediate uh, places you can work in this. Uh, e exercise platforms, where instead of trying to fool somebody, we all get together and do a cyber exercise. That still needs to be a very authentic infrastructure. It just doesn't have to fool anybody. So there are intermediate places. The information uh, sharing networks I mentioned, uh, what are the trust models? How do I control information to and from uh, the different parties? How do I form these communities and these groups? How do I measure if, I have, if I'm getting the right information to the right people quickly enough? All of that is still an open question. And finally, the, uh, the data analysis component. We collect a lot of data here on malware. We're collecting more and more on threats, on the engagement with these adversaries. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to really do hardcore uh, data analysis on that. So if we can do those three things right, if the community can get together and advance all of this, we turn around and face the threat, then we have hopefully what is a pretty good chance of protecting our networks. Thank you very much.